Hi, welcome to BB Flicks, our monthly look at what we've been uh, watching lately, generally streaming, because we are all still staying at home. Uh, <laughs> I'm Bridget from the Reference Department, and today to talk about our streaming uh, choices, I'm joined by Jeff from the Reference Department, Alyssa from the Reference Department, and Amanda from our Youth Department. Oh. All right, I'm going to start off today with, I think, it was recently determined that it was Netflix's biggest premiere ever, biggest streaming show ever watched by the most people, which is Bridgerton. Mm. Uh, everyone here has watched it, so we're going to just kind of discuss it <laughs> a little bit. So I guess we'll try to avoid spoilers, but um, fair warning, if you haven't seen it, if you're part of the very small group that hasn't seen it, um, we might talk about some things that happen in later episodes. But uh, if you haven't seen it, I think you should. And let me say why. So Bridgerton is a historical drama. It's based on a series of romance novels by the author Julia Quinn, um, specifically the first book in her Bridgerton series, which is called The Duke and I. Um, it did come out, I believe in the year 2000. It has been reprinted many times since then. We have several copies. We have several copies in the library, I believe and also many other libraries have copies. So if you watched the show and now want to read the book, that one's available as well as many other, um, the other books in the series. I believe it was just greenlit for a second season, which is most likely to be based on the second book in that series, which is called The Viscount Who Loved Me, um, which if you watch the show is about Anthony, the older brother of Daphne, our hero, our heroine. Um, it is a romance, so it is a love story between Daphne and the Duke of Hastings, uh, who is very sexy in the show. I'm just going to say it. He's a very attractive <laughs> man. Uh, and it sort of counts their starting a fake relationship that, of course, becomes real because despite their many protestations, these people live in a romance novel. They don't know that, but I know that, so yeah. I know what's going to happen to them. <laughs> Um, even if they don't even if they don't exactly they don't know that's the as in as in the show anthony is often like i will never fall in love and it's like well anthony i have news Just for me. you yeah. yeah you star in a romance series and you're up next <laughs> that's foreshadowing like like hitting you over the head yes yeah uh so it's you know like a big splashy costume drama I think they said they created every costume for the show and it's like 7,500. Yeah, I, I think I read that the main character never wears the same outfit twice in the entire, you know, from one scene to another in the entire show. And I believe it. Yeah, there, there is quite a... Yeah, I have to say, as someone who would never read Julia Quinn, like the books, um, as a romance novel, I just loved it. It was, it's, it's fun. It's just total fun. It's exactly what you need at this time of year in the winter and when you're stuck at home or whatever. Um, it is not at all historical. I mean, it's just, it's a historical, but like, if you care about, if you care, care about historical accuracy, like this is not Downton Abbey, um, <laughs> but it has really great costumes and it's just, it's funny. It's like, I just adored it. It was just so much fun to watch. And I, the other thing I kind of noticed about it, I was trying to figure out what it was that struck me as so obviously different. And I finally figured out it was just the color palette. It's yeah, like, it's very bright. It's very saturated, bright colors that um, look exactly like the cover of a romance novel. Um, yeah. But the whole thing is done that way. And you just get sucked into this like, um frothy fun it's but but on the other hand the acting was good i mean there's some serious stuff that they deal with and and it, it alternates between being like important issues that would have happened in this time period that um about the way women and men interact and the classes and stuff but you can't help but have fun through the whole thing yeah i agree i also think um as a as a, I, I said to some people when I discussed it that as a connoisseur of Shondaland, um, mm. if, if when you wonder who's still watching Grey's Anatomy every week when it airs on television, the answer is me. I watch it every week. <laughs> I have never missed an episode of Grey's Anatomy. It is 
it's basically old enough to vote now as a show. <laughs> Uh, and I, I, I watch it every week. So as a connoisseur of Shondaland, I do think that it fits right into like that brand. Like it really fits her, um, style, even though obviously most of those shows on ABC are contemporary dramas, not Mm. historical. And one of the the first things I pointed out to you was the dishy, um, love interest was also the dishy. Uh, federal prosecutor from uh, For the People. Yes, yeah, another another Shondaland show. And a lot of the directors, I know the um, the directors also worked on uh, Grey's Anatomy and Scandal. In particular, a lot of them were Scandal directors, um, which is also sort of a, a power fantasy that that show is not as light and frothy as this <laughs> I'm coming at this from almost a, a Shondaland novice. I I think I watched the first season of Grey's Anatomy when it came out because I was like in high school and then I went to college and I had no TV schedule. Um, and then um, I haven't watched any of our other stuff because dramas are not my thing. But uh, I do like historical romances and I'd read, I hadn't read the, the Bridgerton series, but I'd read Julia Quinn's other series the Rokesby, which uh, takes place the generation before the Bridgertons, and it has some of, like interlapping characters. Um, so I knew I liked her style um, of light, fluffy romance, and I just I was like, "This is what I need." Candy. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's candy. Someone I I read one review that referred to it as peak sideburns because like every male character has has <laughs> the you know Jane Austen sideburn era stuff. Um, it's, it, it is like Jane Austen with a lot more sex. Yeah, I mean, it's the same time period. Yep. And um, yeah. she definitely uh, made that enemies to lovers relationship uh, very big. Yeah. Also, I, fake dating, which is a favorite trope of mine a little bit. Oh, I love <laughs> fake dating. I, it's something of a cliche among my friends where I'm like, well, I like this one. And they're like, because it's a fake relationship. And I was like, yes, mm-hmm. that's fine. <laughs> When I saw the trailer, I was like, oh, it's got fake dating, it's Regency England, and it's got colorblind casting, although that, that's, they played with that a little bit, because, like, I like alternative histories, and they actually did sort of make it an alternative history, which I appreciated, Mm -hmm. and it sort of flew under the radar for uh, a lot of most things that I heard about it. Yeah, well, and and I think that that also pulls from the larger sort of Shondaland, um, more in the Grey's Anatomy vein, where they obviously cast all the roles, um, they they race blind cast all the roles, so none of the roles were written for a specific race, and they changed them depending on the the actor that they chose for them, which, uh, you know, some people don't enjoy, but I think in that show, they kind of managed to ignore those for a little while until they didn't. Like, that's the thing is like, they kind of, it was not the point of the show. So they would often not discuss it, but it did, it does come up and it is something that they talk about on that show. It just took a while for them to sort of build into that. And I think deliberately in the same way they kind of did on this show where it's like, oh, at first we're not gonna acknowledge this. And then it is in fact a, a plot point kind of, but it's it's sort of hidden and under, under the radar. So, yeah, I, I like that too. And also, now, I haven't seen this, but it, I've read people comparing it to, um, is it called The Great? The one about Catherine the Great? Oh, yeah. Um, I talked about that last time. I think you a, did, a, yeah. A, a similar kind of uh, appeal. And I wondered, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't seen it. I wondered if anyone felt that way. I think I can definitely, I can definitely see that. I feel like the, first off, the color palette, just like the bright kind of in yeah. your face but also the kind of alternative history um and that also did have colorblind casting although that did was not discussed as such um like they did in Bridgerton but it was um um you know it was the whole show is supposed to be a little more frothy and and yeah 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 So well, if you are one of the like five people in the country who haven't seen Bridgerton yet, then <laughs> we recommend that you do so. Yeah, if you're a Netflix subscriber who somehow hasn't watched it, definitely go to I, I'm also going to give a really quick one last thing. I'm going to give, she's not the lead, 
but uh, Nicola Coughlin, who plays oh, yeah. Penelope Featherington, which is one of the characters, is she's she so is, good on this show. Yeah. And I do love her from, I already loved her from uh, Dairy Girls. If you haven't watched Dairy Girls, mm-hmm. I would also, that's also on Netflix, highly recommend. It is about four teenage girls and one teenage boy who live in Derry in Northern Ireland during um, the like early nineties. So sort of the troubles right, right in the, yeah. Right. Towards yeah. the sort of end of the troubles and, troubles. and they're, they're li- and it's so <laughs> funny. Highly recommend. It's such a good show. So if you've never seen it, you should watch it. Yeah. She was fantastic. I, yeah. I just loved her. Um, I am also, I'm really hoping that the popularity of Bridgerton will open the doors to other romance series because there are a lot that would make really good TV mm. shows. They're just, they're interesting stories and, um, it, you know, the series are long enough that there's a lot of material to pull from. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping to see a lot more in the future. Yeah, I am too. And Netflix has, I will say this is Netflix's first like historical one, but they do have two based on like contemporary romance novel series. Um, I haven't watched them because they were not ones that particularly appealed to me, but they have Virgin River, which is based on a series of books by Robin Carr and Sweet Magnolias. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the author of Sweet Magnolias, but they do have those two shows and they, but they are contemporary and set in the U.S. So Hmm. there are some other ones. I think they're significantly less light and frothy and they do not have that Shondaland touch if that is, which I think really elevates Bridgerton. Um, Hmm. So I hope that, but I agree. There are lots of historical series that I would like to see adapted. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so I think that concludes Bridgerton Corner. Um, Does it, (laughs) who's watched anything else this week, this month? Well, yeah. on a oh, historical Alyssa. sort of um, thing, I, I watched, finally watched uh, season two, or rather like the second part of The Alienist, which was on TNT this summer. And I don't have cable, so I had to wait until it appeared somewhere. And it was on HBO Max this month. I The first part was a miniseries based on the book The Alienist, which came out in the 90s. Yeah. And it's a murder mystery with a psychiatrist, as they na- we now call them, uh, no- then known as an alienist, solving crimes of um, unacknowledged, uh, like the downtrodden, right? It was boy prostitutes in the first season. Someone was murdering them in a uh, turn of, almost turn of this, like 1890s New York City. And it had Dakota Fanning and two other people I cannot remember, um, but it was really good. And the second season picks up and um, it has, it's very like historically accurate. Um, and they do, but and they interact with famous people occasionally, like for the first season, uh, Teddy Roosevelt is then the commissioner of the New York City Police Department. And in the next in the most recent the second part they have the Vanderbilts they have um, the dusters Goo Goo Knox a real is a real duster who is featured there and um, it's it's gritty it's very much not Bridgerton's because there's (laughs) there's murder and um, just the the underclasses and their their troubles so even though the, the the protagonists are like wealthy high society Dakota Fanning is uh, a very privileged orphan and the other two the, the they are they're classmates of Teddy Roosevelt at Harvard so you can figure that out Fancy. <laughs> yeah but they they advocate for the um for the the less fortunate and making sure that they receive justice so I it's really good it's really well acted and I love dramas so you'll like these uh, if you love dramas, and I'm not necessarily, I like some some murder mystery stuff, but this is more like a historical thing than than like. It sounds like way, it has a lot of atmosphere. Yeah, it's mostly atmospheric. In fact, the mis- you find out who did it in both parts. Uh, like halfway through the season, it's more about them finding the killer and bringing them to justice. 
Um, is the first season on HBO as well? Yes, both seasons are. The, the second part is also called The Alienist, but it's called The Angel of Darkness. Okay, which I believe is the sequel book to The Alienist. Yes. There, mm -hmm. there are two. The Alienist, uh, I've never read it, but it is like famously, it's like super historically detailed. So it's like, there's like page long descriptions of like what the streets were laid out in and like, yeah here's the menu at this restaurant they go to, <laughs> like, here's the entire menu. It's, it's sort of- I remember of... reading it when it came out and I really liked it, but it's so long ago, I've forgotten all the details other than the, the general atmosphere of it. It also has a really cool sort of theme, um, uh, scene, scenery, and that they sort of rewind the architecture back to what it looks like uh, in 1890s New York. Mm -hmm. So they like dismantle the, scar the skycrapers and the, the Statue of Liberty becomes bronze again and it's, uh, takes off her face. So it was really <laughs> cool. That's interesting. Who's next? I think it's free for all style. I can go next. Okay. Uh, I've been watching um, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. So uh, the first season came out last year and um, the second season is currently running on uh, Hulu. Um, and the Hulu only has this what's, what's on of the second season. Um, I started to rewatch the first season a few days before the second season dropped and um, then it disappeared <laughs> before I was finished. <laughs> um, but it's about Zoe, who um, she is a young computer programmer working at a startup in San Francisco, and um, she goes to get an MRI one day, and uh, an earthquake happens, and all the music that the technician was listening to gets like rattled around in her brain, and uh, she ends up being able to hear people's inner thoughts expressed through song. <laughs> hmm. um, and they're like well-known songs. Like they didn't, uh, it's not uh, an original musical. So um, they'll do songs um, from all across the ages. So like her dad sings a song, um, uh, Moon, Moon Dance, um, but they also do like Beyonce. So it's like, it's across the whole, um, the whole spectrum of music history. Uh, and she's the only one who can hear these people. Um, everybody else just thinks that it's absolutely normal. Um, and in the first season, um, it's, I'd say it's, it's pretty light, um, you know, but in the first season, her dad is dying. Um, so it does deal with a lot of really serious things. Have you, as, have you, any of you guys seen it? No. I haven't seen it, but I have seen the commercials. So I do know the premise at least. Yeah, it's, um, I'm, I like musicals in general. Um, and it was just, I just turned it on one time last year and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, although it is, you have to take a lot of it with a grain of salt and not just the fact that she can hear. Uh, <laughs> hear people's inner thoughts through songs, but like the fact that she can afford her own apartment in San Francisco, and even as a computer programmer, that is not something that happens. <laughs> this um, is where we like to live in the fantasy world of the television show. Yep. Beyond. Yeah, and she has like her neighbor who is one of the only people who knows about her, um, her ability um, and is trying to figure out, like help her navigate um, why it's happened to her, um, who does it not seem to have a steady job. Like at one point we know he's a DJ and that's about it. <laughs> but again, he has his own very fancy apartment. <laughs> um, and then my husband's a computer programmer. So all the scenes that take place within um, her startup company, he's like, this is not how it works. Like, this is not how businesses work. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a fun show. Um, again, I just, I like musicals and it's, it's funny, but it also has, again, a lot of seriousness. Um, yeah. The second season is now like her dealing with the aftermath of her dad's death and having to um, negotiate that. Plus her um, brother and his wife had a baby and they have to like negotiate that. And, I don't know. It's good. It's fun. Yeah. 
it's fun. <laughs> well, and it's always nice also to have things that you're watching like as they come out. So that's good. Yeah, something to look forward to. Yeah, exactly. What we need that. We need that yeah. so much. Things to look forward to. Yeah. Things to look forward to. All right, Jeff, you're up. Um, so I watched, um, well, I can tell you, I, I have been watching The Stand. I'm not going to talk about it because um, it's not even over yet. Um, I have also been watching The Stand. Because... I, I'll, maybe when it's over, we, maybe the next time we do this, we could talk about that. It's, it, it, I, I read it so long ago that I don't really have a sense of how well they're doing it. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, but um, something that's much shorter that I watched this weekend and I'm often the last person to see things because I see an article that says, did you miss this when it came out six months ago? Um, but we watched a really fun uh, retro sci-fi movie called, um, on, and this was on Amazon, by the way, called The Vast of Night. And I liked a whole bunch of things about it. Um, and one of the main ones is like, you, you don't know almost none of the major, um, none of the characters are major actors that you would have heard of. And I kind of like it when you focus on the acting rather than the actor. Um, so even though a couple of the, uh, the actors have been in some other things, it, they're mostly unknowns. And it got a lot of press, I guess, because um, it was done pretty much on a shoestring. It was like $700,000 or something, which yes. for, for a full length feature film is not that much. Um, and they did amazing things with it. It's some of the, the um, the camera work and like there's some tracking shots in it that for for an indie film like this I was amazed at some of the camera work that they did in it and um, the two main characters which I'll talk about in a sec are I thought their performances particularly for kind of not really unknown actors were superb and they carried the whole film um, so it's um, it's it's very retro it takes place in the 50s in New Mexico and it's about aliens. Um, and um, the, the two main characters are Everett and his, um, his platonic friend who uh, named Faye, who I think is certainly younger than he is by at least a couple of years. He seemed, um, I think she's still in high school and he's like- He might've just graduated or something yeah. like that. There's, there's a, enough of an age difference between them, but they're both kind of techie geeks. He's, he does a radio show she works the switchboard in this little town, um, the phenomenal switchboard. And um, so the premise of the, the, the plot is that um, in the night, uh, it all takes place in one night, um, there's a major basketball game going on and the whole town convenes in this little, um, uh, uh, what do you call them? <laughs> you play basketball. Arena. Like, well, no, like a field house, like a school yeah, field house. Like a um, and um, gymnasium. So most of the people in town are there, except for a few random others who, who aren't involved in this, and he's doing his radio show. Anyway, the whole, the whole point is, um, they, while they're doing this, um, both of them hear a sort of strange sound come over the radio, like a weird pulsing kind of sound that doesn't make sense. And she hears it when she's doing the switchboard, and he, um, she, um, sends it over to him doing the radio station. And it turns out that this is some sort of otherworldly signal. And they talk to some people and he um, ends up having, um, he broadcasts it on the radio station to see if anybody knows anything about it. And a couple of people call in and share their stories. And it leads them on a, a, a sort of mini quest because it all takes place in just a few hours of figuring out what they can find out about this. And then there were reports from some people in the town of like, maybe there's something weird going on in the sky tonight. Um, so it, it very much has the feel, if you, if you liked the, the retro feeling of Stranger Things or remember Super 8 um, that came out a few years ago, it has that like old fashioned sci-fi movie. There's no violence, there's, it's not terribly scary, it's just, but it is very suspenseful because it's, it's, it's just creepy. It's the atmosphere. And I thought they did a really good job of that because it's all the acting. Um, there's, there's so little of it that 
blows you out of the water like a, a big blockbuster um, sci-fi um, special effects kind of thing. There's there's almost no special effects in it. It's all this the tension of something weird is going on in my town. What's happening? And following the intensity of these two characters as they try to figure out what it is. And I thought they're like I said, they're they're acting particularly the 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 young girl. What's her name? Um, uh, Sierra McCormick, um, and she's only like twenty, and she plays she plays Faye. And there's one scene where she's on the switchboard, and it's it's ten minutes long, without a cut. It's just her, like, doing dialogue as she talks to various people and passes calls off to each other, and it's just the camera on her for ten minutes, and for an actor of her age to be able to carry that off so well, I was really impressed. Um, so I think if you if you like kind of under the radar, um, retro indie kind of things, I, I can see the people who are involved in this will probably go places now that this, um, it's gotten amazing reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and um, IDMB and places, IMDB and places like that. Um, and it's only an hour and a half, so. Yeah, I, I, I watched it this summer when it came out and I also was very impressed. One of the things, and you kind of alluded to this, one of the things that I was impressed with is it's really like scripted. It's like long conversations or even monologues from people. Yeah. But, um, like, and so the action, like, so the, that is like often tight shots on people's faces, but there's still a lot of very interesting cinematography and like the tracking shots and the way they sort of lay out the geography of the town was very assured and like looks much better than you would expect from a movie like this. Cause a lot of yeah. indie movies are written as long conversations that you do just like one, two shots of people for the whole time. And this yeah. really doesn't. And it, it really made the most of like how yeah. to. Yeah, they had some, they had a couple of traction shots where they basically went from like one end of the town to the other up through the window into the, um, the field house where they were playing basketball out through the other door and you know on a shoestring budget like this it was pretty impressive what they were able to pull off um, yeah I, I was very impressed when i when i watched it, i was it, very impressed with the visuals yeah. and and it i think punches I, above its weight absolutely yeah. and it's just fun i i i found it a really good like again if you if you like your sci-fi without a lot of actual gore or scary it's just it's atmospheric and fun yeah, Twilight Zoney. Also, if you're a Twilight yes. Zone, yeah, it, actually, it has that kind of feel. Obviously, it's longer than a Twilight Zone episode, but um, if you are a fan, I think that that's that's very like in that wheelhouse. But, so that's on um, again. It's called Vast of Night, and it's on Amazon. All right, I think I think that's every thing. I will I will circle back to talk about the stand because I am also watching that in the in the future um because i've been watching that and i have read the book very recently and i'm also a big fan of that book so i have lots of thoughts on that adaptation <laughs> i'll be curious to hear what you have to say because my my remembrance of the book is like bare bones so yeah but i'm enjoying it so i think with that we're all set we will see you back here in february for more exciting discussions um, until then, stay home and stay safe. This yeah. is my Bye, everyone.